You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we begin the origin, the history, the dogma, and the identity of the ancient mystery religions which are now known as the mystery schools, the Order of the Quest, Freemasonry, the ancient order of the Rose and Cross, the Knights Templar, the Sovereign and Military Order of the Knights of Malta, the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, the Priory de Sion, the Thule Society, or sometimes known as the Thule Society, the Order, the Skull and Bones, the Russell Trust, the Jason Society, the Scroll and Key, the Illuminati, and I could go on and on and on and on. But the most important thing to realize is that they all have been collectively known throughout the ages as the mystery schools, the Illuminati, which literally means illumined ones, international socialism, communism, they are all one and the same as you will come to know. And you will understand perfectly how they've been able to infiltrate all of our society. What you hear tonight does not necessarily reflect my views, our beliefs, our religion, nor those of WWCR. That song will have a clear meaning to you as we progress in your education into the mystery religion. But we have to begin in the beginning with every story and every history. And we have to begin at the beginning of mankind. And the beginning is the beginning according to the mystery religion. And they believe wholeheartedly that man is a product of evolution, not of an extraterrestrial race, and not of the creation of some benevolent God. They believe that the tree-dwelling ancestors of man were among the most intelligent beings of their distant age. And when these creatures finally abandoned the trees and walked fully upright, freeing their hands to serve as implements of their minds as well as their bodies, there began the most successful evolutionary drive toward higher intelligence ever witnessed in nature. As ground dwellers, these creatures were easy victims of the great predators who hunted them down by day and surprised them at night as they huddled in clearings or in caves. They could not compete in strength, ferocity, or speed with their attackers. Armed with little except their hands and what their complex brains enabled them to do with those hands, they had to think or die. For untold thousands of years, most of them met early, violent deaths. Only a few in each generation had the good fortune and the ability to outwit their enemies. And these favored ones survived long enough to have and rear offspring. The unwary, maladroit, or stupid, died early. And folks, I'm afraid that the stupid who live today are going to die early also. But back to the beginning. Their offspring, if they had any, were left to starve or be eaten by predators. Natural selection was operating on the earliest types of man with grimmest intensity. Perhaps no other extent creature has undergone so severe and protracted a period of selective elimination. Yet, here and there, Small groups managed to survive because they had the intelligence to use sticks, stones, and clubs to defend themselves. Crude and puny as these implements were, they were weapons, and their possessors were the first creatures who could kill without having to come in direct contact with their antagonists. As the great beasts grew larger and either faster or more formidable, Man became ever more watchful, ever more successful in pitting his wits against mass and power, more and more adept at slipping out of trouble, and as the challenge grew greater, so did his brain. 
for the laggards on both sides got left behind in the race for the future. And we are still engaged in that race for the future. The steps in the development of man's brain are revealed by the progressively larger brain cases which appeared with the passage of centuries. Basing our judgment on the improvements in tools and weapons which took place as the intelligence of their inventors increased, we can construct some of the ways in which natural selection may have worked to bring about a doubling in size of the human brain. Many edible nuts are too hard for even a caveman to crack between his teeth. Accordingly, they were useless to early man until some genius of his day discovered that any nut could be opened if it were just placed upon one stone and struck hard with another. Better fed, the family of this innovator proliferated while the others died off. Perhaps centuries later, while a man sat cracking nuts between two stones, one stone broke, and the broken edge cut his hand. Previously, men in the same situation had thrown the broken stone away and nursed their cuts. But this man, this man, started thinking. He possessed an original thought. Since the edge had cut through his skin and drawn blood, it might also cut through the skin of the small animals he caught, making it easier to get at the meat. The first knife was invented. He and those close to him and those intelligent enough to imitate them increased in number and the rest died off. They had a cutting tool which made it possible for them to skin and eat meat in less time. So they had more time for hunting. Many of the descendants of this exceptional man became increasingly skillful at breaking and chipping hard stones into sharper tools and weapons. And if you've been to a museum of natural history and you've seen these fine, beautiful, flint arrowheads and spearheads, then you know that it took patience and great skill. And this means a further development of the human mind. Natural selection favoring better knife makers went on for hundreds of thousands of years according to those who guard the secrets of the ages and even according to modern science. A great many centuries later, a young father foraging for his brood may have come upon a long straight stick splintered at one end. Well, he pulled and chewed at the splinters until only one stout point was left, or at least that's how we can imagine that it was done. It seemed to him a very useful stick, for it was sharper than the digging sticks which the women used. He may have remembered a night during his boyhood when a great cat had charged his family's campsite and dragged away a younger sister. Now that he had small children of his own, the memory of that attack was ever present. Lately, he had seen fresh panther tracks. Another family not far away had been attacked and the mother had been killed. His dawning intelligence told him his pointed stick might be a better weapon against big cats than the clubs which he and the other men carried. So for many days he kept the long stick near him, even when he was laughed at for having what was regarded as a woman's tool. Not only did he possess a greater intellect than his fellow men, but he possessed more courage to resist their laughter. Then one night, he heard a faint rustling. He whispered a quick warning to his family. Suddenly, a dim shape charged at him in the darkness. Kneeling, he raised the point of his long stick toward the beast. It sprang, clawed at him savagely, then fled. The creature 
had struck the point so hard that the blunt end of the stick was shoved deep, deep into the ground. Next morning, following a trail of blood, the man found a panther dead from a punctured chest. The long, sharp stick had saved his life and the lives of his family members. In the same situation, less perceptive men, armed only with clubs, would have been killed. From that time, he, his sons, and their sons carried impaling sticks whenever big predators were near. Foresight, genetically transmitted to their descendants, had given them a new weapon, which they used with devastating effect against their natural enemies. Perhaps many generations later, a bright descendant of the inventor of the impaling stick mated with the daughter of a man who had thought of throwing a club at fruits, nuts, and small animals on the lower branches of trees. Now and then, this brought down an extra meal. The man who knew how to defend his family from feline prowlers soon learned from his woman the new way to collect additional food and their young family thrived, and some of the children, with good mental inheritance from both sides of the family, showed an even higher order of intelligence than either of their parents. With impaling sticks added to their clubs and cutting stones, men no longer had to be such furtive food gatherers. The hunted gradually evolved into hunters. And in times of famine, when battles over food were fierce, those with impaling sticks threw them with deadly accuracy at members of other hunting bands. Sharper stone knives and spears gave a double survival advantage during times of crisis. But the most telling gains were the increasing sharpness of minds. However incomplete our knowledge of human ancestry, there is scarcely any doubt that the development of brain power of intelligence was the decisive force in the evolutionary process which culminated in the appearance of the species to which we belong. Natural selection, they believe, has brought about the evolutionary trends towards increasing brain power because brain power confers enormous adaptive advantages on its possessors. It is obviously brain power, not body power, which makes man by far the most successful biological species which living matter has produced. Even with man's new weapons and tools, it did not take him very long to decide that in this world the single greatest enemy to be feared was the darkness of night and all the unknown dangers that came with it. Simply stated, man's first enemy was darkness. Understanding this one fact alone, one can readily see why the greatest and most trustworthy friend that the human race could ever have was, by far, heaven's greatest gift to the world, that glorious rising orb of day, the sun. And with this simple truth understood, we can now begin to unravel the most ancient and still the most successful religion upon the face of this earth. Its success lies in its ability to remain hidden from the rest of the people. But first, let me assure you folks that no people of the ancient world believed the sun to be God. In point of fact, every ancient culture and nation on earth have all used the sun as the most logically appropriate symbol to represent the glory of the unseen creator of the heavens. In the Old Testament, it says, quote, the heavens are declaring the glory of God, unquote. That's in Psalms 19, verse 1. In the Old Testament, quote, the sun of righteousness will arise, unquote. Malachi, chapter 4, verse 2. The ancient peoples reasoned 
that no one on earth could ever lay claim of ownership to the great orb of day. It must belong to the unseen creator of the universe. It became, figuratively speaking, not man's, but God's Son. Truly, God's Son was the light of the world. As I stated before, folks, in the dark cold of night, man realized his utter vulnerability to the elements. Each night, mankind was forced to wait for the rising of the sun to chase away the physical and mental insecurity brought on by the darkness. Therefore, the morning sun focused man's attention on heavenly dependence for his frail short existence on earth, and in doing so, it became the appropriate symbol of divine benevolence from heaven. For without the sun there was no light, there was no warmth, and nothing could grow or live upon the face of this earth. So just as a small fire brought limited light into man's own little world of darkness, likewise, the great fire of day served the whole earth with its heavenly presence. For this reason, it was said that the God of the Bible was a consuming fire in heaven. And so he was. It was accepted by all that man was bound to a life on earth, but the sky was the abode of God's Son. He resided up there in heaven. Ancient man saw in his male offspring his own image and likeness, and his own existence as a father was proved by the person of his son. It was assumed that God's Son was but a visible representative of the unseen Creator in heaven. So it was said, Quote, when you have seen the Son, you have seen the Father, unquote. Said another way, quote, the Father is glorified in his Son, unquote. Ancient man, even with his limited intelligence at that time, had no problem understanding that all life on earth depended directly on life-giving energy from the Son. Consequently, all life was lost without the Son. It followed that God's Son was nothing less than man's Savior. Since energy from the Son gave life, and we sustained our very existence by taking energy in from our food, which came directly from God's Son, the Son must give up its life, supporting energy, so that we may continue to live. God's Son must give his life for us to live. Now, I know that if you are intelligent out there listening, you are making some connections here. You see, the mystery schools believe that Christianity is a perversion of the mysteries. While it was plainly true that our life came from and was sustained each day by our Savior, God's Son, it was and would be true only as long as the Son would return each morning and our hope of salvation would be secure only in a risen Savior. For if he did not rise from his grave of darkness, all would be lost. All the world waited for his imminent return each morning. The Father would never leave us at the mercy of this world of darkness. The heavenly promise was surely that, quote, he would come again, unquote, to light our path and save those lost in the darkness. Logically, even if man himself died, as long as the sun comes up each day, life on earth will continue forever. Therefore, it was said in the ancient texts that everlasting life was the gift that the Father gives through his Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that we may have life everlasting on earth. And the ancient text did not mean for you personally, but on earth, everlasting life. That is the interpretation of the mystery schools. Since evil and harm lurked at every turn in the fearful dark of night, all evil or harmful deeds were naturally the works of darkness. And with the return of the sun each morning, man felt more secure in his world and therefore was at peace. 
Therefore, God's Son was, with his warm rays of hope, the great, quote, Prince of Peace, unquote. And of course, the reverse was equally true. The evil of night was ruled over by none other than, quote, the Prince of Darkness, unquote. Hence, evil is of the dark, or the devil. It was only a short step to see that the light of God's Son equated with righteousness and truth, and evil with darkness. From then on, it was simple to understand. Light was good, dark was bad, and the priests of the ancient mystery religion always followed the light. They always looked toward the east. They considered themselves to be illumined. That being true, then the great orb of day, God's Son, could rightly say of itself that, quote, I am the light and the truth, unquote. We should all, in their words, not mine, give thanks to the Father for sending us his Son, spelled S-U-N, in case some of you were getting confused. In every instance where I have mentioned the word Son, it has been in reference to the Son, S-U-N. For the peace and tranquility he brings to our life is even called solace. Solace is from the word solar, which means sun. Are you beginning to see the light? <laughs> we now have before us two cosmic brothers, one very good and one very bad. One brings the truth to light with the light of truth. The other is the opposite or in opposition to the light, the opposer the prince of the world of darkness. It is at this point we come to Egypt. More than 3,000 years before Christianity began, the early morning sun, the Savior, was pictured in Egypt as the newborn babe. The infant Savior's name was Horus. The early morning sun, our newborn babe, was pictured in two ways. The dove, known as the bringer of peace, the hawk, the god of war who punishes the enemies of God. Today, in government, we still use these terms, doves and hawks. And that's how powerful this hidden religion is, is that we use the terms of this religion even today and know it not. At daybreak, this wonderful newborn child is, of course, born again. Hallelujah. Horus is risen. That is what hallelujah means. Even today, when the sun comes up, we see it on the Horus Risen, or Horizon. His life was also divided into 12 parts, or 12 Horus Hours, the 12 signs of the Zodiac. But now, what about the evil brother of God's son, that old prince of darkness himself? In the Egyptian belief system, he was called Set or sometimes Typhon. We are told in the Bible that when God's son died, the world was left in the hands of the prince of darkness at sunset. Sunset. Do you understand? God's son was killed by the prince of darkness set at sunset. It was generally observed that God's Son could be depended upon to return in the same manner that he left, namely, on a cloud, and every eye will see him, unless, of course, you're blind or dead. Keeping in mind that God's Son not only represented the light of truth, but was put to death by his enemies who could not endure the light of truth in their life, it was taught by the ancients that the very act of opposing or denying the light of truth to the point of killing it happened in one's own mind. When we are confronted with harsh realities of life, the truth, the light of truth, 
which we do not wish to face and which runs counter to our views, such truth is put to death by your mind and in your head. Therefore, God's Son, the truth and the light, is put to death at the place of the skull, our skull place, located somewhere between your ears. This putting to death of the light of hope in your mind is always accompanied by the two thieves, regret for the past and fear of the future. Don't go away, folks. We have to take a short break. I'll be back right after this pause. And of course, God's son goes to his death wearing a corona, which in Latin means crown of thorns. Remember the Statue of Liberty? It was given to us by Masonic France. To this day, kings still wear a round crown of thorns symbolizing the rays of the sun. Now, as far back as we can go into the ancient world in our research, we find that all known cultures had a three-in-one or triune God. The very first trinity was simply the three stages of life of the sun. Newborn at dawn, mature or full-grown in its full power at twelve noon, and old and dying at the end of day, going back to the Father. All three were, of course, one divinity, the trinity is no mystery in the mystery schools. The Egyptians knew that the sun was at its highest point in the sky, or high noon, when no shadow was cast by the pyramid. At that point, all Egypt offered prayers to the Most High God. As stated before to the ancients, the sky was the abode, or heavenly temple, of the Most High. Therefore, God's Son was doing His Heavenly Father's work in the temple at noon. The world of ancient man kept track of times and seasons by the movement of the sun, daily, monthly, and yearly. For this, the sundial was devised. Not only the daily movement of the sun was tracked on the round dial, but the whole year was charted on a round calendar dial. Examples are ancient Mexican, Mayan, Inca, Aztec, Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Egyptian, Celtic, or Celtic as some pronounce it, Aryan, etc. And with this method, certain new concepts emerged in the mind of ancient man. Since the earth experienced four different seasons, all the same and equal in time each year, the round calendar was divided into four equal parts. This represented the complete story of the life of God's Son. This is also why we have in the Bible only four Gospels. Of this point there can be no doubt for Tertullian and many early church fathers stated this exact fact themselves in their own writings. And this, the mystery school claims, is why the famous painting of the Last Supper pictures the twelve followers or houses of the sun in four groups of three, the seasons, with the sun in the center alone. On the round surface of the yearly calendar, you draw a straight line directly across the middle, cutting the circle in half, one end being the point of the winter solstice, the other end being the point of the summer solstice. Then draw another straight line crossing the first one, one end of the new line being the spring equinox, the other end being the autumn equinox. You now have the starting points for each of the four seasons. This is referred to by all major encyclopedias and reference works, both ancient and modern, as the cross of the zodiac. Thus the life of God's Son is on the cross. This is why we see the round circle of the sun on the crosses of Christian churches. The next time you pass a Christian church, look for the circle, sun, on the cross. On December the 22nd, the sun going south reaches its lowest point in the sky, our winter solstice. At that lowest point, the sun stops moving on the sundial for three days, 
December 22nd, December 23rd, and December 24th in the southern constellation known as the Southern Cross. Hence our Savior, dead for three days, died on the cross. The Southern Cross constellation, that is. This is the only time in the year, folks, that the sun actually stops its movements in our sky, according to the mystery schools. On the morning of December the 25th, the sun begins its annual journey back to us in the northern hemisphere, bringing, of course, our spring. Therefore, on December 25th, the sun is born again. And to this day, his worshippers still celebrate his birthday. It is at this point that we should look at the significance of the recurring number 12 in the Bible. First, 13 is said to be unlucky for humans. It is a heavenly number and represents the sun plus the 12 equals 13. Our Christ plus the 12 disciples equals 13. It's unlucky for a different reason, folks. And I will explain that on another program, but it has to do with the persecution of the mystery school, the mystery religion. It would be well to get a Bible concordance and look to see how many times the number 12 is used in the entire Bible. Remember, the mystery religion is a religion of the heavens. Also in the Bible, you will find many combinations of the number seven in the mystery religion that represents the seven stars of the Pleiades. And you can see the emergence of the mystery religion in the UFO movement when the Pleiadians come to talk to Billy Meyer in Switzerland. <laughs> oh my, how we are deceived by these people. Here are a few examples of the use of the number 12 in the Bible. The 12 months of the year, the 12 apostles of the sun, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 brothers of Joseph, the 12 judges of Israel, the 12 great patriarchs, the 12 Old Testament prophets, the 12 kings of Israel, the 12 princes of Israel, God's son and temple at 12, and there are many more. All these examples, and countless more, derived directly from the ancient world's fascination with the 12 signs of the zodiac. Now remember, folks, what I'm giving you is the teachings of the Mystery School. This does not necessarily reflect any of my own beliefs or my own religious beliefs or those of WWCR. We cannot fight against these manipulators unless we know who they are and what they believe. And what you want to believe is your own business. As we noted before, folks, the year was divided into 12 equal parts, or months, and to each month was appointed a heavenly symbol or astrological sign. Three of these signs made up one season, and the world, or the heavens, was divided into four separate seasons. Each of the 12 monthly signs were called houses of the heavenly zodiac. The astronomers of Babylon divided the sky into 12 houses. They did this to account for the fact that the planets were not always exactly in the ecliptic, but appeared to wander a certain number of degrees either side of it. They therefore had to assume that each sign of the zodiac extended its influence through a fixed portion of the sky, which they thought of as a house to which a planet could return when it completed one of its journeys about the sun. The great god of the day had its house in Leo, Leo the Lion of Judah, where he ruled at the head of his splendor. The moon ruled in Cancer at the right hand of the sun. The other planets were given two houses, one for day and one for night. And since the zodiac divided the sky into 12 equal portions, each of these houses was also equal, comprising 30 degrees or one-twelfth of the 360-degree circle. And the houses and signs of the zodiac were as follows. Aries was the ram or lamb of God. Taurus, 
the bull, the golden calf. Gemini, the twins, which represented Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, are Jesus and Satan, for in mystery Babylon, Jesus and Satan are brothers, and in some sects of the mystery religion, they are the same entity. Cancer, the crab. Leo, the lion of the tribe of Judah. That can be found in Revelations 5, verse 5. Virgo, the virgin, spring birth of God's son, are Mary. Mary, or Marie, means pure. Thus Mary, the virgin, the mother of God, when God is reborn or born in the spring. And that is where the mother holding the child, Isis with the child, Horus, and all through the history of the world, you will find a virgin holding a child in every culture, every language, in every continent of this earth. Libra, the scales. Scorpio, the scorpion, the backbiting traitor, Judas. Sagittarius, the archer. Capricorn, the sea goat, or the goat of Mendes. Aquarius, man with the water pitcher. Pisces, the two fish. The age that we are leaving at this point in time is the age of Pisces. And according to the mystery religion, we are entering into the age of Aquarius very soon in our future. And to them this has great meaning, for it means the dawn of the new age, the age of the illumined man. The number of the man is six. Six, six in the mystery religion. Today, we have expressions when someone dies. We say things like they passed, or they passed on, or they passed away. The ancients said they passed over from one life to another. Over what? Over the river. And so it was with the coming of spring. As God's Son is resurrected from the death of winter to his new life in spring. This is why Christians celebrate the resurrection with a sunrise service at Easter. And the Jews, who knew this ancient religion from their time in captivity in Babylon, celebrate the same with their Passover. With this knowledge, we now add the fact that the first decan of the astrological sign of Virgo is Coma, or the desired one of the nations. This was pictured by the ancient astrologers as a virgin girl holding a newborn babe. Hence our Madonna and child motif. So in the spring, our Virgo, God's son, is born of a virgin. Incidentally, the astrological symbol for Virgo is the letter M, or Marie, which means pure, hence Mary, the pure virgin. And all through every culture you will find other representations by other names of the virgin mother with the child, Isis with the child, Horus, born of a magical intercourse when Isis changes into a bird and flutters over the dead, Osiris. Osiris representing the sun, Isis representing the moon. I will tell you the meaning of the child Horus other than the sun in the morning, probably in another episode of the Hour of the Time. Now, <clears throat> we belong to one another. According to the Mystery School, we are part of God's creation. We are part of a great fraternity of man, according to them. We are creation's voice to sing praise to God as we gather in the morning. <laughs> the morning, folks, to pray. The very time of day recalls our creation and our new creation in Christ. During the gathering time, reflect on this mystery. Using the silence, the sounds of morning, the psalms and other scriptures, be aware that the rising sun is the image of Christ, our sun and source of life, and that is taken right out of a Protestant church's leaflet calling for the congregation together for the Easter sunrise service. Next we read at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, that God's Son is the chief shepherd. This word chief is very important, for at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, and again at Epithians 
chapter 2, verse 20, God's Son is called the chief cornerstone. Now, in our research into the mystery schools, we find that the word in Greek for chief cornerstone simply meant the peak of a pyramid. The peak of a pyramid. The corner foundation stone, or peak of the pyramid. The prefix acro, or topmost, was added by the Jews to the already existing Greek adjective goniaios, or at the corner. In that way, the translators of Isaiah rendered the Hebrew word for corner, pinya isai, 28.16, describing the stone which was a sure foundation and which probably had reference to the future Messiah. Well understood by the Christian writers was that of an important stone which was both acro, a peak, and a goniaios, a cornerstone. But there are four or more corners to a building, and a stone and a corner cannot be uniquely significant. Although you will find in Freemasonry the ceremony of laying a cornerstone for every building that is built, and you look at all the buildings in Washington, D.C., you will see a cornerstone with the Masonic symbols and Masonic date of the mystery schools of the calendar of 6,000 years. Well, we found that we don't believe that it can be significant unless the stone be at the apex, apex of a pyramid where all corners meet and bond together, and that is the secret of the truncated pyramid missing the capstone on the reverse of the great seal of the United States. For we have found in our research that in the mystery religion, the master mason is the cornerstone or the peak of the pyramid the illumined man, who functions as the eye of Horus or the spy for the mystery schools wherever he is at. Just as the Great Pyramid near Mexico City is called the Pyramid of the Sun, so also the Great Pyramid of Egypt was actually dedicated to Horus, the sun. A picture of this you may see on the back of any $1 bill. Above the pyramid, folks, is the eye the sun, the eye of Horus, the son of God. The New Testament tells us three different times that God's son was taught by and learned all things from the father. He was the pupil. We are told at Matthew chapter 14, verse 17 and 19, that God's son tends to his people's needs with two fishes. The two fishes being the astrological sign all astrologers know as Pisces. Thus we have had for almost 2,000 years God's son ruling in his kingdom or sign of Pisces, the two fishes. As stated before, these signs are called houses. Therefore Pisces is the Lord's house at this time. Truly, the greatest fish story ever told. According to astrology, sometime after the year 2010, catch that date, folks, the year 2010. And remember what I told you about 2001. Arthur C. Clarke is obviously a member of the Mystery Schools. And Stanley Kubrick, who's responsible for making the movie, is obviously a member also. According to astrology, sometime after the year 2010, the sun will enter into his new sign, or his new kingdom. As it was called by the ancients, this next coming sign, or kingdom, soon to be upon us, will be, according to the zodiac, the house or sign of Aquarius. So when we read at Luke chapter 22, verse 10, we now understand why God's Son states that he and his followers at the last Passover are to go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. So we see that in the coming millennium, God's Son will bring us into his new kingdom, our house of Aquarius, the man with the water pitcher. Once we realize that in astrology each month is assigned one of the so-called houses of the zodiac, and in heaven are twelve houses, are twelve monthly signs, then the words we read of God's Son saying, quote, In my Father's house are many mansions, unquote, makes sense when translated correctly. 
The proper translation is as follows. Father's house equals heavenly abode. Mansions equal houses. So correctly read, in the original text we read, In my Father's heavenly abode are many houses. Yes, twelve to be exact, according to the mystery religion of ancient Babylon. By careful intention and study of the houses, you will be better enabled to interpret horoscopes. It is well to remember that just as the influence of one planet in one sign may be effected for good or ill by another planet in another sign, so the influence of planets in signs in general may be strengthened, weakened, enhanced, afflicted, or otherwise altered by the influence of planets in houses, according to their beliefs. A rule of thumb to remember is that signs measure your inherent qualities. The planets influence those qualities, and the houses indicate directions for them. In other words, the houses indicate certain things, and a planet in a house influences or activates the things indicated. Now, this is all according to their religion. If you want more explanation, please ask Nancy Reagan. Anyone familiar with modern-day Christianity must surely know we are said to be living in the last days. This teaching is in part based on the idea expressed in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20 of the King James Bible, where God's Son says, quote, I will be with you even to the end of the world, unquote. End of the world? Yet another simple mistranslation to clarify, and there are many in the Bible with a proper understanding of the actual words used, this end of the world is translated differently in various Bibles. Some say end of time. Some say end of the days, and still others say conclusion of this system of things. So what does all this talk of the end times or last days really mean? Well, here's the simple answer, folks. According to the mystery schools, when the scriptures speak of, quote, the end of the world, unquote, the actual word used is not, I repeat, not, end of the world. The actual word in Greek is aeon, which when correctly translated means age. That's spelled, folks, A-G-E. Any library will have Bible concordances. Strong's Bible concordance is a good reference work to use here. Look up the word age in any secular dictionary or Bible concordance. There you will find the word for age is from the Greek aeon, or A-E-O-N. Remembering that in astrology, each of the 12 houses or signs of the zodiac corresponds to a 2,000-year period of time called an age. We now know we are 1,992 years into the house or age of Pisces. Now correctly understood, it can rightly be said that we today, in fact, are living in the last days. Yes, according to the mystery schools, we are in the last days of the old age of Pisces. Soon, God's Son will come again into his new kingdom, our new age, and that's where all this new age movement and new age comes from, new age of Aquarius, man with the water pitcher, Luke chapter 22, verse 10. That's right, folks, the new aeon, or the new age. This, according to the mystery schools, is the perversion of Christianity. This is the theme of the Bible, God's Son and His coming kingdom age, the new age of Aquarius. Now, what you choose to believe is your business. Remember, don't get mad at me. I am teaching you the mystery religion of ancient Babylon. And I am telling you right now, many people practice this mystery religion in secret, and they hate Christians. They hate Christians because they believe that Christianity is a perversion of their religion and thus is their enemy. When viewing the shimmering rays of sunlight on a body of water at dawn or sunset, according to the mystery schools, one can still see today how God's Son walks on water. Good night and God bless you all.